Well, hello, everybody. On this episode, we're going to try to answer the question, why I am still IFB. And um, when you watch this episode, we try to be gracious and thoughtful. I know there's 10,000 different uh, things that we could have said or uh, different uh, areas that we could have responded here during this episode. Uh, But I believe that we handled things graciously and thoughtfully. And I do want to thank my guests because I asked them to come on and address a very, very hard uh, issue. And uh, but I think everyone came prepared. I thought they were thoughtful. The answers contributed very much to just our reason. Why are we still IFB? So I hope you enjoy this episode. I hope it is a blessing to you. Uh, and if you have any extra thoughts, or you even want to reach out to me uh, with some thoughts that you might have had concerning this podcast or different answers or concerns or whatever, uh, pastoral thoughts, mail at gmail.com. God bless you as you listen. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. Today, we have a special episode, special edition, Why I Am Still IFB, or Why uh, IFB. And uh, we have very special guests with us. They're going to introduce us here in a minute. What this show is going to be about is um, we're going to have a response to, there's been a movement, a deconstructionist movement, uh, recovering fundamentalism. Uh, and then people uh, leaving the IFB, um, Independent Fundamental Baptist. We're going to define that in a minute. Uh, and then also there's been some two recent documentaries we're going to talk about. Uh, one is Shiny Happy People, and the other is Let Us Pray. And so in this episode, we're going to define what the IFB is, for those who don't know and those trying to figure out. And uh, we'll try to figure that out ourselves, uh, And then we'll talk quickly uh, about the IFB, what it is defined. And then, uh, then we'll talk about our personal IFB backgrounds. And uh, then we'll talk about the documentaries and then hopefully summarize it and try to help some people and uh, just kind of explain our position and our thoughts on everything. So what is the IFB, Brother Gabe? Uh, well, you were going to go through the Wikipedia definition first. Oh, let's do the Wikipedia definition. <coughs> okay. That we could so the, expand on that. And the reason why I brought a Wikipedia definition to the table is because uh, Wikipedia does not have a dog in the fight. Uh, and obviously, it's a very public uh, organization. So here's, here's Wikipedia's definition. The beliefs are mainly Baptist and fundamentalist. They refuse any form of ecclesial authority. Uh, other than that of the local church, so there's local church government. Uh, Great emphasis is placed on the literal interpretation of the Bible as a primary method of Bible study, as well as the biblical inerrancy and the infallibility of their interpretation. Dispensationalism is common among independent Baptists. They are opposed to any ecumenical movement with denominations that do not have the same beliefs. And that's Wikipedia's definition. So my, my thoughts on that would, would broadly align with what the Wikipedia definition is, but I would expand upon that to say that fundamentalism or the independent fundamental Baptist movement is a descriptor of, of a person and not of a group of people, not necessarily the a denomination. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And just in trying to search for what it means to be an independent fundamental Baptist, you will get just about as many definitions as there are churches uh, that would be grouped in that group. And so I, th- I think the, the biggest descriptor of what it means mm-hmm. to be an independent fundamental Baptist is that it's, it's difficult to define. Mm-hmm. So the, d- the, and the definitions are blurry. Uh, and so there's many different many different groups out there that would define themselves as independent fundamental Baptist or uh, would not. They're just some sort of independent church out there, and nobody can put their finger on their doctrine or anything. Yep. What does IFB mean to you? What it means to me is it, it's a uh, it's a movement that is uh, adheres strictly to biblical authority, which then allows me to be free to uh, learn the scriptures for myself with the guide of a pastor and um, 
it allows me to adhere to the fundamentals of mm-hmm. the faith. Now, that's that's the question is, what does it mean to have the fundamentals of the faith? And each church is going to determine what those are. Yes. Uh, so themselves. that's why there's such a broad variety. Correct. So many different flavors. Uh, so, so for me, if somebody says, why are you an independent fundamental ba- Baptist? I'd say we're independent and autonomous. I believe we're self-governing after the model of Scripture. Mm-hmm. That we get uh, that model from Scripture. It's clearly defined in Scripture that churches uh, are to be autonomous. And then also uh, fundamental. And fundamental, the word fundamental means to the root of. So if you're a basketball coach, you're teaching the fundamentals, you're teaching dribbling, shooting, yep. uh, whatever. What What is um, the basic to your faith? What is the root of your faith? Uh, and so we would say we get the root of our faith from one place. We're not a creedal people. We, we are a people with... Um, the word of God. Yep. So we're fundamental to the word of God. Uh, what's the literal interpretation of scripture? And then we'll try to follow um, to our closest possible ability um, as our conscience demands uh, we follow. And, and to that point, when, when we're talking about not being a creedal people, where uh, what that allows for a fundamental, what it means to be a fundamentalist is that uh, the word of God becomes what we are beholden to and not a creed. Mm-hmm. So people that uh, adhere to a creed, like say a Presbyterian or, you know, London Confession, 1689 or whatever confession you hold to, that becomes the authority rather than your own Bible study. It, within, su- it supersedes the Bible. The way, the way that I look at it, and then if you're, you know, if you're a Presbyterian, watch, I'm not trying to insult right, anybody. We're not trying to but insult. Here's but here's what I'd just, say is that and they would in, agree, a, in a know, sense, your, your creed, you might be holding higher than the word of God, and then also pressing your creed down into the word of God, mm-hmm. where we want to take that away and just go right straight to the word of God and point to the different scriptures for what we believe. Um, I want to read one more thing about the IFB defined, and then we'll get into some personal stuff. And we'll, I mean, we're going to get right into, we're going to be um, just open and transparent about the, the film and our own uh, thoughts and things on that. So we'll get into that here in a minute. But I wanted to read this in Wik- Wikipedia. So again, this gives us validity to our show. So in Wikipedia, I read the definition. Uh, and then it also says on Wikipedia, in 2018, an investigation by Fort Worth Star-Telegram identified 412 abuse allegations in 187 independent fundamental Baptist churches and institutions across the uh, United States and Canada, with some cases reaching as far back as the 1970s. In November 2023, an investigation discovery released Let Us Pray, a ministry of scandals, a four-part documentary highlighting sexual abuse and cover-up within the independent Baptist movement. And that's what we're here to address today. Yeah, amen. And uh, so what we do now is uh, each one of us will just kind of tell us a say our name because we hadn't seen our, said our names yet. <laughs> um, and then just our background in the IFB. So why don't you go first, Jonathan? All right. Well, I'm Jonathan Major. I am the assistant pastor here at Lighthouse um, under Pastor Young. And um, do you want me to give my background? Yes, I do. Oh, okay. I didn't know if you wanted to introduce first. Um, I grew up in Rochester, New York, and um, I have been Baptist um, from the time I was a baby, brought into the church, and uh, my dad is a pastor. Um, and so I have, I guess you could say, no, no, no other church. I've never been to another church unless the church that uh, defines themselves as an independent fundamental Baptist mm-hmm. church. Um, and um, I've, you know, fellowship with other churches, been around with other churches. I know, um, a lot of Baptist people mm-hmm. and, um, and you've been to different conferences and things like that yep, where yep, there's yep. a lot of different Baptists. I'm very people. familiar with and, and, uh, Paulina, you go. I'm Paulina major. I'm John's wife. Um, I kind of a similar, but different upbringing to John. So I started coming also to lighthouse when I was around five with my mom and siblings so I grew up in the church also, in this particular church, actually, kind of similar. I've only really been in one church all my life, but have, same to John, a lot of exposure to different people and conferences and things like that. Um, so I was saved here in this church and rededicated my life to the Lord here in this church. Um, one slight kind of difference from John is I ended up going to Bob Jones mm-hmm. University, which I find um, a little different. And that mm-hmm. was a really um, interesting time in my life because that was the first time I was exposed to 
things kind of outside. Now, the Bob, Bob Jones is, is a um, non denominational school, isn't it not? It is, right. So mm-hmm. it, most of the things were very similar in what I was accustomed to growing up. But um, it was the first time I was, my faith was really, maybe not my faith, but some of the standards that I had never questioned before, things I just took it at face value, were um, questioned or just encountered some differences. And I really had to work out my own beliefs and why I believe them. And I think it was a really um, pivotal time in my life and made me who I was mm-hmm. today. And um, after that experience, chose to come back here and still serving here in the same church I grew up in. Amen. Amen. Brother Gabe. Amen. Well, I'm Gabriel Gonzalez. I pastor currently at uh, New Testament Baptist Church in Arundacoit, New York, uh, sent out of this church here at Lighthouse. I grew up at and was saved as a child in at Calvary Bible Baptist Church. And growing up there, which is a sister church to this one here in Lighthouse, and, and growing up there, I had no idea of what fundamentalism was or mm-hmm. any circles within fundamentalism. You never thought about churches outside, outside of your Outside of, of that. Uh, right. Maybe as I got a, a teenager, you might be aware of different things, but mm-hmm. um, never really... Uh, had to work through any of that. And then I left the church as a teenager, uh, had a period of rebellion, rededicated my life to Christ at 26. And when I came back, I really came back as a as a blank slate, uh, really wanting to know. You're just open to the truth. No, I just wanted to is. know what the truth was. I wanted to, I came back to the church that I grew up in because you got to start somewhere. But uh, I really came back by just wanting to know the truth and allowing the truth of the Word of God to lead me to where He wanted me to be. And um, uh, over that time, it was starting that process, I then became aware of different circles of fundamentalism, that there's different ways of thinking, different approaches, different, approaches, different, different method, methodology um, mostly. You, what you grew up in was a... Uh, Influenced by Peter Ruckman, wouldn't you say? Well, yes, uh, you know, not not to give the whole story, but uh, but in that journey, I was very much uh, influenced by Ruckman and uh, those and, circles. And we have across town First Bible Baptist, and mm-hmm. you you were directly influenced by them as, as yeah, well. Yeah, he would and come every year. They would do Bible blowouts there. Ruckman would come preach. Rex so, Rex so that, Harrison. Yeah, so that'd be your circle. Uh, and yeah. let me uh, say too, all four of us were saved and in, independent. Baptist Church. Correct. Yep. Um, so I, uh, my first pastor was Jack Hiles. You know, my, my name is Jack, and I was born in Hammond, Indiana. <laughs> right. And uh, my parents went to college there right after salvation. They were saved in a Christian Missionary Alliance Church here, uh, I believe it was in Webster, here in this town. Um, and so they went off to Hiles Anderson and uh, we're very influenced by Jack Hiles, and I grew up in a pastor's home. Uh, my dad worked in the missions ministry for Jim Vineyard, who is another big player in the IFB. Um, and then I was a student at Hiles Anderson College for a semester. Um, I was a student at Hiles Anderson, um, I'm sorry, Oklahoma Baptist College, which was Jim Vineyard's college there. Um, and then I got saved at age 22. After a little stint of you know rebellion and doing whatever, uh, and then I ended up at Heartland Baptist Bible College, which is a part of the BBF movement, which claims uh, two to five thousand independent Baptist churches in that fellowship. Uh, so Heartland Baptist Bible College, I graduated from. I would say the preacher that influenced me the most, probably in my life, is Sam Davison. I'm not close to him, but I was he has a big church, and I was in his church, and he just influenced me in a tremendous way. And then also, I am a graduate of Crown Seminary. I did that correspondence. I didn't uh, attend Clarence Sexton's church, but um, I highly esteem Clarence Sexton as well, uh, and graduated from Crown, and Crown is Southwide Baptist Fellowship, which is, a, which is another whole region uh, in the southeast of America, um, um, Lee Robertson's old stomping grounds down there, and so I, I've had exposure to different uh, realms of fundamentalism, and uh, there's a lot of differences, like Brother Gabe was saying earlier. Yeah, uh, a lot of different methodologies, and uh, so that's my experience in the IFB. Uh, and, and what's that? I said you've been around. Y- yes, and I, for whatever reason, um, that's how the Lord designed it. 
And um, so it's been a blessing to see all those different perspectives. Um, you know, we have guys on this podcast that get to go to like, let's say 52 different churches, some of them 60 churches in a year. Yeah. Um, they would even have more yeah, of an sure. eye mm-hmm. um, than I did. Uh, as far as is what's going on in this different independent Baptist churches, but it is big and big, big and vast. And so, um, shiny, happy people. I probably saw it a couple months ago. Same. Is that about how long ago yep, yep, you watched yep, it? A little after you. And uh, did you guys watch the Duggars? I love the did. Duggars. Yeah. Okay. I knew a lot of women that uh, loved the Duggars. Yeah. What did you like about that show? So... I liked their, their life looked so perfect and I wanted my life to look like that. It looked like this, the epitome of Christian happiness Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. they were pretty and, and well-spoken and, um, it looked like they had just so much fun and I just wanted my life so deeply to be that. And that was kind of my experience before, um, maturing a little bit in my faith, I think. And I was really drawn to this, just this. Yes. I don't know. Perfectness. Yes, Mm -hmm. exactly. So I really liked them for that reason. Yeah. Yeah, I I think that's a big, what was the big attraction? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm not afraid to admit that I watched, you know, (laughs) several (laughs) episodes of that. I mean, you know, um, you want to challenge my manhood, we could go around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) We could go around back, but um, I watched it. a latte over there. I'll tell tell you what what attracted me to the show Mm -hmm. was that it was a validation Mm -hmm. of, to me, of a lot of the standards that I held if, myself. If you have these rules, and you too could have a perfect family. It was yeah, like one well, of the first. It was just more of like, a, like a utopia, a proof uh, of like a proof of concept, really. Right. Like, like it you're was, not alone. Like we're, yeah, I'm not alone, mm-hmm. and that this actually does work, and you actually can be happy and have standards, and you don't have to bow to the world's pressure yeah. and things of that nature. And so I, that's kind of what tra- my, attracted me to that that my show. F- my, my father and mother have a great marriage. They're coming up on 50 years of marriage. But um, I got to see a husband and a wife in a home. So I, I wasn't, they come from a background of like chaos. Um, and, and so, in, you know, I think my, my father's uh, a little, and all his brothers are kind of like, if someone's putting on the dog or putting on the show, they're like, you know, come on. You get, are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. Um, but there was a statement on the show that articulated for me because that show gave me the willies. Like, I, I don't know if it was like PTSD or whatever, um, but it's too perfect. Stop, stop. That's a show. Mm-hmm, this yeah. is ridiculous. And you're making your kids act because a lot of pastor's kids out there know what it's like to be made to act oh, and yeah. perform. Yeah. Um, and, I, I, you know, just to be honest with you, as a pastor's kid, I like hated that nonsense. Well, <laughs> like funny I, is I'm, and, a, I'm a pastor's kid, and, too, and, and I felt the same way. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, um. And so that gave me the willies. There was a lady on that show that made a statement that I, something I believed, but I couldn't articulate it. Um, they were all playing violin, like all the kids, and they're smart, like the huge, mm-hmm. shiny, happy people playing their violins. And she said, when I saw that, because she was from that kind of a background of really like top-down, authoritarian um, structure i can't remember exactly what her story was but she said i knew what it takes to make everybody act like that Mm. yep Mm. and uh, i thought oh that's exactly why that show gave me the willies but i knew like paulina like um other people that just loved it and like that is the perfect family um when that show was going on i'm like no no way um but that yeah, could have just been my cynicism. I don't want to yeah, say yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. No, but it, it's interesting that different, you know, different upbringings will will bring it out. I mean, I, I didn't have a father in the home. Yeah, I didn't know what it was like to have a family like yeah. that. But I do know that that's something that I, I wanted and something that I wanted to be like. Right. And so, so you see the show. You mm-hmm. see the production. Yeah. They've got skeletons in their closet. Yeah. Okay. Um. Do you remember what the skeletons are? I don't want to like miss uh spoiler so, so alert. Josh. Well, I think everybody should, should know. I remember what Josh was a Josh Duggar. Yep. So Josh Duggar had molested some of his sisters. Right. Correct. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and the family knew about it, but it was covered up. And so I think because you have the show, 
the show must be, go on. Yeah. And right. look at where we're portraying. We're teaching people how to have this great home when you really don't. Well, and it's like you what know, Gabe I, said. I he, see the same thing projected over churches who are putting on a show. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like what Gabe said, too. You know, for him, it was a validation of an ideal. Right. And I'm sure they looked at it and said, well, if this comes out, then every naysayer is going to say, ha, it doesn't work. See? Right. Um, right. And, right. and I, I think there's so many parallels between Bill Gothard mm-hmm. and then also Jack Hiles and that model and the scandals that were going on at the time mm-hmm. is that they were selling a concept. Yep. Right. So, you know, Bill Gothard, what would you say the tenets of Bill Gothard are? Well, I, I, I don't know that I could articulate exactly what his tenets are. It's like the umbrellas of authority. But the umbrellas so of umbrellas authority. Umbrellas of right. authority. Yeah. And then the father is patriarch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I, there was two different uh, Gothard groups, um, one in Oklahoma City that we would uh, rent out their, they had a whole building. We'd rent out their floor for Valentine banquets at our church. Um, and there was some Gothard people that came in Oklahoma City to our church. They would not join. They didn't. They weren't part. They didn't join a church because they didn't believe in being underneath that umbrella, that authority. Right. Mm-hmm. They, the family, was an authority to itself. They would right. participate in church, um, but it wasn't plugging the system. It was no have this structure in your home, and everything's going to be wonderful. Right. <laughs> right. And then I see, like in a church culture. It's the kind of this very similar. Oh yeah, yeah. Like our send your kids to our church school. We'll give them a Christian education. We'll separate them from the world. Um, get plugged in the youth program. Um, come so winning on Saturday. Be at church on Sunday. So plug into our church seven days a week, and everything will be wonderful. Right. Yeah, and and I think that you can get caught. Yeah, the when when you're selling a system and a system like that. I can remember being a part of a church that was like that, and I was always at church. And it just it seemed like at some point when I started, you know, just looking at what what we were doing as a church, I was like, when am I supposed to practice being a Christian? You know, when, I'm, when am I at, supposed at to home. practice this at home? Yeah. Because right. I'm never there to practice right. it. Right. Amen. I'm always at church and it's some, it's. And uh, so your life was out of balance. It's, it becomes out of balance. It wasn't holistic. It wasn't holistic. And then you start um, to. As uh, a, so, so for the folks listening, how would you describe the documentary? Because we're going to talk about the, you know, those two documentaries real quick. Yeah. Uh, what would be an overview? Does anybody have an overview idea? Yeah. Of, yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, it, 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 the documentary. So shiny, happy people. It mm-hmm. literally is, it starts out by really, um, showing the ideal that the Duggars built and showing the empire that they created just based off of their family and really um, lifted it up to its heights. They were the model family for a man by the name of Bill Gothard, Mm -hmm. who was a part of this big homeschool movement, and he had all this curriculum. Mm -hmm. His recipe Um, for success in the family. And the odd thing is, is this guy was not married, and he did not have (laughs) children, but he was teaching the world, you know, his formula for a perfect family. Right, 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 which is smart, right? Yeah, snake oil salesman. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, But, you know, and then... And then again, some people are blessed by Bill Gothard. We're going to talk about this later on, uh, but there is truth in some of. I mean, he had some. He did have some just pretty amazing biblical books and things like that. Um, but the system as a whole um, was was corrupt. Besides the Duggar family, what were some of the other things that uh, were talked about in that documentary? With Bill Gothard in general, I think there was a lot of um, children. And parents who came forward saying, well, I really trusted that this was going to keep my family out of the world. I think in that time frame, there was a real reflexive movement away from um, society, away from liberalism, away from anything that would Mm -hmm. um, ruin your kids, so to speak. And so these parents said, you know, I found this guy, I found this curriculum, he had this, you know, um, weekend event or whatever that I went to, and I bought in. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't just the Duggars, it was you know, multiple families, multiple parents. Um, and, in, and in Bill Gothard's um, defense, just a little bit, I was. Wa- I remember one of the things I thought when I was watching the show is that, you know, some of these kids were abused by parents. Oh, yeah. Um, and the abuse they received was not the prescription that Bill Gothard was offering up. And, you know, and right. I thought, you know, Bill Gothard did not tell your parents to, like, beat right. you black and blue and right. uh, all these things. Oh, well, we're going to get to this, but also – who was the power in Bill Gothard's system? Who was the patriarch? Right. It was the parents. And so 
when someone is given too much power, too much authority, and too much position. And they're accountable to nobody. Of, exactly. Mankind right. abuses it. Right. So. Exactly. So you see an institution, the family being out of balance, you know, mm -hmm. then you're going to have, yeah. then I, I think um, in documentary number two, unless you, anybody else have anything to say about the Goth, are we going to circle back? Well, if we're going to talk about out of balance. We could probably finish it out with just what the Duggar family, it was out of balance on steroids. Yes. Because not only was it out of balance, but also there was cameras. And um, I can't and imagine as a too. kid. Like what? a lot of money involved also. Yeah, absolutely. I think was one of the biggest right. things I was a little shocked at was how and much Dad that was played just raking into the, in the dough. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. And so it's going <laughs> to yes. change the way that you parent. It's going to change the way that you treat your kids. And it did at the end. I mean, he, they had terrible relationships with their father because of the money well, that was you involved. you made your kids childhood stars. And uh, we'll talk about Dave Hiles in a minute. Uh, but Dave Hiles was the best pastor in America, uh, the greatest youth pastor with the world's biggest youth department at 19 or some 19 oh years goodness. old, I think he was. That's, that's not good. Um, no. And it's, you know, the Bible says it's good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. So uh, when you're a little kid and you're a movie star, you end up like Kevin McCauley. Mm -hmm. McCauley Culkin? Or, yeah, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin's from Home Alone. Yeah, yeah, I, know yeah, you, yeah. I know what you meant. Kevin it, from Home Alone. He yeah, played whatever. He played yeah. Kevin. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Blended That's the two hilarious. names. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I weirdly Kevin. knew what you meant, though. <laughs> <laughs> Not funny. Um, so anyway, yeah, those kids were, um, again, doomed. And, oh, yeah. and I think, you know, if you're a pastor, don't project your kids kids and you know, set them up and and make them put on the dog for everybody like it's a like a like a, a puppy you know a dog and pony show yeah well as a youth leader too i think one of the things that i struggled with as a teenager was like gabe said one you're in an environment that is teaching you that there's one right way to do things and uh, you know flooding you with that but then and, also and to me to, to me legalism and correct me if i say something something you know or whatever add to it gabe okay is that um yes some people i heard like over we watched a podcast that uh the guy said they're not you know we're not legalistic we're not saying you have to do this to get saved um but legalism goes past salvation that says if you do x y and z it equals right this over here right good good children if you ask somebody who turned out good children you'll say what's your formula what'd you do mm -hmm. they'll say man it was the grace of god yeah mm -hmm. right they don't have say, a I use Bill Gothard's system, a recipe. and I made yeah, it. A, a, well, yeah. a system of a system of laws either to get salvation, or to get some, or to get product. approval from God. Yeah, right, right. right. Is equal legalism. Yes. There, 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 it's legalism on either side of salvation. Right. And what I think a lot this, of what Bill Gothard's system God. is, or what a top-down authoritarian system is in other. Uh, mm -hmm. other churches uh, that that a set of rules in order to maintain favor with God, even if you are saved and you don't preach that that's for salvation, will still teach your children that God's favor is conditional yes. Yes. upon your adherence to the rules, which uh, ironically you, you this, never do well if you, enough. If you and do so this, this will be the outcome. Right, and that was the complaint of these people on these, on these well, I didn't watch Let Us Pray, but Mm -hmm. which is a different, I guess, a different thing. Yeah. But on Shiny Happy People, that was what these people that felt the need to leave the IFB and then now try to tear it down as being a systemic thing, that's what they were trying to portray, that, well, this ide idealism right. of Bill Gothard is in every IFB church, and therefore right. there's this legalist attitude and, in every one of those and churches. And so these two documentaries are funny because Bill Gothard, <clears throat> I don't know if he openly spoke against Jack Hiles, but he was like, 100% against Jack Hiles' right, style. Right, which is ironic. And right. then Jack Hiles would preach against Bill Gothard. Yeah. I, I remember him saying, he's like, here you have a man uh, that doesn't, is not married. And, you know, and, you know how he preached. And uh, doesn't have any children. And you're listening to him. You know, that, that type yeah. of thing. Uh, so he's preaching against Bill Gothard. Um, but in a sense, they're, they're opposite sides of a coin. Yeah. Um. I, I believe the portrayal of bad fundamentalism we'll talk about in, you know, let us pray is that if you do X, Y, and Z, like you come to church seven days a week mm -hmm. and you plug into our system that you'll have a good outcome. Right. I, and I, I just want to say this real quick about fundamentalism. Then we'll talk about let us pray here in a second. Yeah. Um, I read a book by George Marston and it's called the history of fundamentalism. And he's, um, he's a Christian scholar 
right. not IFB, whatever. Right. Um, but you'll find out that fundamentalism really um, heaps up in society anytime there's a great change in society. Right. So in modernity, 1900s, here you have like steam engine train, and then you get motor car, and then you're getting tele, you know, they get electricity, and so society's changing. It's a roaring twenties. There's um, liberalism in the church, and so then you had the fighting fundamentalist was like a huge fundamentalist movement from 1900 to like 1930. I'm a little bit wrong on the dates, yeah. but then um, we go off to war. People get conservative again. Mm-hmm. Then they come home. There's an age of prosperity. Uh, the greatest generation has the baby boomers, and then you have a radical change in society. Mm-hmm. Um, now you have, like, for instance, the TV. And um, so, you know, it's just picture your mom and dad. You know, when we were kids, we didn't sit in on Saturday and watch cartoons. Mm-hmm. Well, they didn't even have a TV, mm-hmm. Ma, so, yeah, yeah right, right, whatever. Right. They, they listen to the radio and the yeah. kids show on the radio or whatever. So society's radically changing. And then you have the hippie movement. You have the boomers. And... Um, and then you had like the Nixon law and order. Um, let's go back to the 1950s. So from, they say from the 1970s to about the 1990s, there was a nostalgia for 1950s culture. And I think, and particularly with all like the standards and the, you know, no TV, these, um, a lot of these standards were drawn from what did they do back in the 1950s? Mm-hmm. And we need to get back to the fundamentals. Right, And so it, it was almost like a political and cultural movement. And so people wanted to get back to the nice warm coat. They want Warden June Cleaver. Right. Right. And, and so I, I mean, I was in church in the eighties and my dad had a, a growing church. It was amazing growth. Um, and I remember people like they get saved or they come to church and they start plugging in. They come to everything. It doesn't happen anymore. Right. But if they you know, come Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and then they put their kids in a Christian school, um, and, it, and it seemed like people wanted some sort of safe environment. Safe, yeah. Yeah, right, right. And, yeah. and, um, and so there was that movement during that time. And then also with the IFB movement, we grew enormously during the 70s and the 80s. And at the same time, Southern Baptists had um, a liberal movement. Now, they had a big come back i think in the, was the late 80s yeah they something like that a couple different yeah, yeah. Conventions, so yeah. there was a lot of people leaving southern baptist churches and joining independent fundamental baptist churches mm-hmm. and then you got um along comes guys like uh, jack hiles who had the biggest church in america mm-hmm. and this is like a very conservative hard uh, you know people there worked real hard and I believe that would uh, that would be kind of where we start. Let us pray. Before we move on to that really quick, um, you guys made a mention of a lot of things, even what you were saying about society there, um, with people feeling safe with the rules, people plugging in because they wanted to protect their children, um, and even going back to, you know, the, the Duggars and all that. Um, in a culture, like, I want to be in right. a culture. Right. Well, there's a, there's that a statement that I've, I've, ma- I've made and heard many people say, is that rules without relationship equals rebellion. Great rebellion. And so as parents, as pastors, as leaders in any way, shape, or form, if you institute um, a recipe of rules for someone and you have no relationship, it's not based off a relationship. Mm -hmm. If I parent my children out of fear and not out of love, it will equal rebellion. And so in that Duggar situation, in the next... um, let us pray. And in society at that time, rules were lifted to this high ideal, but relationship was left off. And, and so you'll see that in the, the next. And then you, you, al- you also add into that just the American consumerism, right? Mm-hmm. which was very big back in the 70s, 80s. That's where we get all their, our, you know, our capitalist drive today. Yes, right? absolutely. Uh, and that, Bill Gothard saw an opportunity to provide a product right. that people were willing to consume. Ca- Capitalize on it. There's money in it, and, <laughs> for sure. And uh, not that I'm not going to ass- assign his that that was his only motive, right? But it's just the the element of American consumerism, along with an entire generation and, of people wanting more rules and wanting more, mm-hmm. right? That there was uh, there was something to fill that void. There's yes. an opportunity to there monetize was, it, and yeah. that's how capitalism works. Mm-hmm. Is you find a niche. You find a market, and man, you sell, 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 sell. Yes. Yep. Yep. 
And then it's on the rise of all that, you have some of these other um, personalities that come up, mm-hmm. and then you have these problems because they're man, they're and ultimately man-made systems. And and, uh, I, and yeah. you know, and uh, and people who listen to this, who like, whose parents got saved as adults and didn't grow up in church, and your parents adopted some sort of a system that was an answer answer system, you have to give give uh, your parents a break. Yeah, right. Uh, because like you know, like my parents got saved when they were in college and you know, they're told like a formula for this Christian family. Well, we're going to have a Christian home. This is the formula. This is the way you do it. Here's the list of rules right. and you do this and this is going to be the outcome. That's not to say your parents didn't love you or had a relationship right. with you. Yeah. And, and think how much like I, you know, how much your parents sacrificed, like, like mine did to send me to Christian school and, uh, or even like home schools, a lot of stinking work. Um, but they, probably had the right motives at heart yeah. right and regardless of your upbringing and uh, you know uh, so a lot of these folks on these this documentaries that i that i watch or these deconstruction videos that you see out there um regardless of your upbringing everybody without exception has to forgive their parents <laughs> yes at some point for yes. how they were raised or what they did that wasn't right but uh, but one thing everyone has to come to the realization mm-hmm. is is that your parents did what they believed was right at the with the knowledge that they had, and did they do the best they could with the knowledge that they had is the question. Not did they right. do everything right, or were they were uh, you know gullible and mm-hmm. they should have never brought me to that church or, right. or you know. Uh, but but did they do what they could with the knowledge that they had? You and learn if, that real quick when you become yeah, a parent. When you too, become a parent, is, oh my goodness, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Of course, because you know when our kids are older, we're gonna be. Yeah, I wish I did so. You oh know, yeah, absolutely. I wish I did things oh, differently. Absolutely. Um, so what so was let, let, us let us pray about? Let us pray. I don't know. You, do you want to do this one? He does not <laughs> want to do this one. <laughs> you did the overview. So. Um, I get, I get. It's been I, how long has it been since you watched? I, I bet it's been a month since. Wasn't I that long ago? I maybe watched maybe it three recently. weeks. Basically, it was a bunch of women coming out um, and not only making allegations but retelling their stories about what happened to it them. It was hosted by Recovering Fundamentalist Podcast, Correct. Mm-hmm. and uh, it was a yep. documentary is on HBO, I think. Uh, I maybe like I think I watched like it through that. Discovery Plus. Um, but it was like a professional documentary. Oh, yeah, it was well done. Just um, documenting their abuse. How many victims were? I think there's maybe eight victims yep. in that uh, documentary. Um, and then um, there was a few, I would think three churches stick out in my mind in that documentary. Uh, First Baptist Church in Hammond, they portrayed as the, the top of the, the triangle. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, Jack House was like the the Don, the mafia. Well, you know, they mafia claimed leader. he founded the IFB, which... We'll get is, into that. Is ridic- but, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. ridiculous. But yeah. That is absolutely ridiculous. That's been around uh, at least technically probably since um, um, who down there, J. Frank Norris, we left the Southern Baptist Convention. And, I mean, there's been a – and then uh, phil- philosophically, there's been IFB since, uh, I, you know, I believe yeah. John the Baptist. <laughs> right. <I don't> know. <laughs> right. um, long time. I'm <laughs> not, not a writer um, or anything. but um, I understand why people would think that he founded without yes. digging a little bit. So he did have the biggest church in America. And then um, they they get into the history back there in the nineteen seventies, and uh, man, it's common knowledge you get online um, things with Jack Hiles, things with his son Dave, and uh, Dave has a, a a crazy record. Yeah, their First Baptist Church in Hammond, then down a church in Garland, Texas. Uh, there's even deaths of two different infants. Uh, there's a girl. There's a girl on there that was Dave Hiles' daughter that says that she remembers, or one of the memories yes. of her, her father was holding a gun to her mother's head, saying, "I'm going to kill um, all of you." Yeah. Yes, and so you're talking about a pr- uh, predator extraordinaire, uh, Dave Hiles, and um, and then then it was about different cover-ups that went on. So there was definitely a culture of cover-ups. I don't know how you could say otherwise there right. at First Baptist Church in Hammond. I mean, there's not just smoke, man. There's fire right? Um, there. And then the other church that uh, is was highlighted was Bruce Goddard Church in California. And there was two different perps there. What was the worst one, Paulina? I thought the youth pastor, I think his last name was Fox, was the one that stuck out to me the most. It, and it was the first one, right? I believe so, yeah. Um, it was very 
interesting that uh, um, the access that uh, he had to this girl, her, his victim. It's like what you were just saying, cruising, seven days a week. And seven days a week at school, at bus visitation on Saturday, all day at church on Sunday. And at their home, too. They kind of took her in as their daughter figure. So if you notice on these documentaries, 99% of the victims are fatherless daughters. So, Dad, you do play a super or important role in your... they had a father, their father was abusive and right. not or he was what he should have been. father was right. a exactly. loser. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so this girl, he had complete trust from the mother because, you know, again, there's not some bull-nosed, bulldog dad... Which is a mistake. Look, ...looking like, why are you sniffing out my daughter? <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Um, and, and so he's cruising around, like, in the church van with her and then, you know, uh, rapes her... Now here's what it says in the documentary. The pastor there told him he got 24 hours to get out of town. Uh, and they said in the documentary he went back to First Baptist Church in Hammond, which I don't know, again, with the documentary. I imagine it had to be somewhat accurate on a documentary or else you get sued for defamation. You would hope mm-hmm. so, yeah. yeah. Um, and and uh, then the next youth pastor also was uh, molested and raped girls, I think. And then this, it's the same thing, right? He sent away. I don't honestly remember that one, yeah. I We may have missed that um, portion of the show. My question with that, though. Okay, so here's the only defense I have for Bruce Goddard. It sounds like he's, like, the worst guy in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and covering up these crimes where these right. um, these guys should and be, like, executed, wrong, let alone yeah. prosecuted by the state. Right. But um, my only defense f- for him would be, isn't there laws in California where that would be a crime that wouldn't, as a pastor or as a principal of a school, you would have to be a mandatory reporter? So how is covering that, a that defen- up, how I, is that a defense of him? I don't really get that. Well, I'm just saying, wouldn't the wouldn't the state of California prosecute him if he was guilty of that? And then those girls, if they're going to protest, they should. I mean, should wouldn't be it be a it, criminal? Right. Act. There should be a criminal investigation. Well, and that's inconsistent because the one in Michigan, the primary person they're angry about is the pastor, and he wasn't even the one. He just failed to report it, which right. I get. No, that's no, also no, no Bruce too. Goddard didn't do anything either. I mean, right. himself. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right. He was just like covering up, like a yeah, serial cover up. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the one in um at uh, in Gaylord, John Jenkins Church, um, what was the accusations towards him? So uh, the Bible teacher at his Christian school um, had molested multiple girls. Um, he had gotten in trouble a few times. Um, and the one of the girls came forward, apparently, is what they said, and um, alerted the church about the, the, the um, incident. And what they said is that um, he told the school teacher that uh, you have till the end of the year and then you have to get out. Um, and he didn't and, alert. And did, the, did the documentary say exactly what he got caught for during the year? Who's that? The teacher? Yes. No, it does not. Not that I. Not there was accusations. There was accusations about so something he, that he did. So here's was just the one question. Um, so if he was molesting somebody or whatever, and he sent him away, man, that's terrible. It is. It is. Um, now, if there was an accusation and he didn't know for sure. Here's here's what I think I would have done. I would have told the deacons and the pastoral staff. Right. Say this is what was done. He says he didn't do it and there's no proof or anything, but I'd feel weird about it. We know we need to send him on down the road. Right. Because if you get up in front of your congregation and, hold on, by send him on down the road, you don't mean send him to the next church. You right, mean right. Kick right, him right. out. <laughs> exactly. Right. And then be totally honest with anybody and even tell him you know, you go anywhere. And apply for a job. I'm going to tell them what went on here. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that was and, one and of the we'll, things. We'll talk about the weaknesses and the solutions. The weakness of the IFB and people aren't sent. Because I'm going to say, hey, Gabe, I got this pedophile, man. You want him to come work at your church? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> the, I, the, the weakness is some guy comes and he, he's got some vague resume and, and, and you don't know about it. Well, yeah, I was just going to we'll say that Bruce that. Goddard in California, he really needs to rethink his hiring process because back-to-back youth pastors that are raping and molesting people right. is a problem. I mean, well, you, and, you, and you then, need to do background. Then, then here's my thinking, too, and we'll talk about this in protocols, is you didn't take care of it. Therefore, you made a culture. It says it's okay. Inside your church that says it's fine. Right. 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 
um, you facilitated that culture. And, and I think that's exactly what I went on at uh, First Baptist Hammond. Um, so now John Jenkins has been on this podcast before. And I remember back, I think four or five years ago, the first time he came to our church, I called him and asked him, and he was very um, kind to me on the phone. He spent probably like an hour with me on the phone walking down through, and I'm not going to recite what he said because I'll get it wrong. It's been four or five <laughs> years ago. Right. Um, so the accusation was for him on the documentary that he didn't let the church know what this guy did. Right. And sometimes you should. Like, for instance, at our church, we had a thing, you know, um, somebody taking some money, and we dealt with that. Uh, in a business meeting, uh, the, the police were made known. We made an agreement with the guy, and the guy continued to be a church member. Uh, you know, we forgave him. We, you for, forgive somebody, but they don't get their trust back. Right. right. So we don't, you know, they're still a member of the church, but they're not put in charge of the ministry anymore. Right. 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 Access so that, to, in no yeah. access. Right. You know that. But in the case of, of sexual abuse, yes. N- yeah, none. It's and cut so, off, yeah. Well, yeah, and we'll we'll, we'll talk get to about, that. Yeah. yeah, we'll get to that. Um, obviously, they broke a crime in that state. You have to have to. Report, report it. it. Um, yes. Well, and we'll, also why it was so important that the church was made aware is because the pod, the um, show goes on to say that the one of the girls was, um, you know, molested or whatever, and then you know a year later after the guy had left, he calls her mother and asks her to come babysit for him out of state. So the girl moved out of state, and then no, the no, guy. No, no, just the the teacher moved out of state. Right, the teacher moved out of state. Yep. But the girl was out of state when she was sent for as well. She was down in Ohio, if I remember oh, she? correctly. Okay. She she wasn't at Jenkins okay. Church anymore. Okay. And so she's very upset because if Jenkins would have told her mom. Well, yeah, we haven't gotten to that yet. Right. So she got sent for, and the, the guy asked, hey, can we can your daughter come and babysit for me? And her mom didn't see a problem with it because that's the Bible teacher. What's, right. what's the big deal? Right. Sends her there, and there she gets raped multiple times, and just it's horrible, terrible. Um, awful, but she it comes, blames comes the back, pastor. Yeah, she comes back to that Ohio, and I think it was 10 years after she was first molested by him or something like that. Something like that. that and, a and so mom tells Brother Jenkins, and he says, well, I'm not surprised what happened. At least that's what there. they claim that he said. That's what, they, right, again, right, yeah. again, so again on documentary, mm-hmm. that's what was said right. that he said. Right. Um, and so they're upset that he didn't, do something. Do something back then. It. And then sh- they said that he didn't report it then in Michigan. Um, and he says he did. So, again, that's... Uh, he said, she said. Yeah. Exa- exactly. Um, that's so, obli- obvious, obviously, with the victims, let's talk about the victims, because we want to sympathize with the victims for a minute. Oh, absolutely. Sure. How, did I, it, how I, did it make you feel? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I saw your face. I know you didn't want to watch it. I knew what it was doing. To yeah, it, I mean, it is a very it's, disturbing document. You feel terrible after it's done. I mean, it, yeah, it makes you sick. Yep. Yeah, it was. I had a really hard time getting through it and watching it and just thinking um, about how they must have felt and how they feel now and especially seeing how their walk with God was affected was mm-hmm. really hard for me to see because it, they were portraying, I mean, the way that these men made them feel, they're portraying that on God, and now their spiritu- entire view it's of spiritual him. abuse, yeah. and we'll talk about the different kinds of abuse here in a minute. Um, so they, these guys came in the name of God, which I, I really think is the worst form of blasphemy, yeah. and, and I think that is taking the Lord's name in vain. Right. You're using Jesus' name to molest a girl. So, yeah. and, and I think that's what Christ is talking about when he says, it's better for you for a millstone to be you know, than to make one of these little ones stumble. I believe that the crime, as far as in the law, the church is not to kill anybody. Right. <laughs> okay, there's separation between uh, church and state. Uh, you know, there's a, a different institutions. The government is supposed to be the punisher, but if the governor, uh, the government punished according to scripture, I believe that that would be a capital offense. For sure. Um, it, it would be equal to man stealing because you really stole this girl's life in a sense. You, you stole her innocence um, you have damaged and destroyed her life in the sense that not that these girls' lives are over, but there is a part of them that has been taken away forever, something that they will never get over. I think that's the hardest part of the show is you see that in their eyes. Mm-hmm. You see that in when they're retelling their stories that it it changed who they are. It changed the trajectory of their life completely from that moment, and it's awful. Yeah, there, there really is no... Going back, which is why, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, why it's so important to prevent these things from happening because 
uh, once they happen, uh, there's it, there's no going back to before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's the same as as taking a life. Like once that bullet is out of the gun, there's no right. whatever happens after yeah. that will never. Uh, you can never remedy that. Yeah. Right. And um, and so and it, I didn't it, watch the the Let Us Pray documentary, but I did watch uh, reactions to it and and different podcasts that had reviewed mm-hmm. the documentary. Yeah. That's kind of you, my... You, you probably got more <coughs> from that than... I mean, the documentary is very visual and mm-hmm. it's testimonial and really the facts could have been compressed down into an hour and 20 minutes. I would have loved that. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you know they, they slowly, methodically unfold these stories and there's a lot sure, of repetition. There's a, there's a drama right. there, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and there, yeah, I mean, you're... you're well, you and know, it's there's, effective. There's, there's an and, answer, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's very oh, visual. It's there's, a show. Yeah, there's yes, an entertainment it was a show. value yes, to it. Absolutely. You know, there, there's a reason why there's entire channels dedicated to crime dramas. Yes. Right. Um, and so, I mean, that kind of. So, talk, I don't know if that so brings, talk about the different kinds of abuse. Well, that kind of, yeah, that, that brings to a reason why I wanted to be, uh, when I said yes to come on this broadcast, is because of the, um, just the broad brush painted by these documentaries yes. that make the IFB. Uh, we already established we don't really you know, however you want to define that uh, but there's uh, that it's a systemic issue uh, yeah, then you bring now you're bringing in, me as in, a, as an independent in, um, fundamental one, Baptist one, pastor one of the things in the documentary i mean the guy i don't know <clears throat> i don't know the background of the guy but i mean who does the recovering fundamentalist podcast mm-hmm. seems like he has an ifb background for sure i mean he seems to know is he a, does he claim to be a believer yeah, I think so. I, I mean, I don't, I'm not exactly sure. Well, yeah, just, and that's just, not just, the only just, podcast that I've watched. Just, just to give your whole life, um, and obviously he puts a tremendous amount of work uh, into this. Um, but, yeah, he definitely has an axe to grind with the IFB, and I have a problem with him because everything is saying, like when the girls say, well, in the IFB, and I'm thinking, um, okay, there's ten to 15,000 churches. How many of those have you been a member of? Right. And so um, I've never heard of the book you're talking about, and it's I've say been like in the, the pastor makes you read this some book. major circles, or well, they um, use language that make it feel very cult like. Yep. and I think right. that was kind of intentionally done intentionally done. Yeah. to make yes. it have this flavor of cult. Um, just the language and the way that they refer to things um, was done. And I, th- I think that they it's easy to pin a cult on a group that's like legalistic okay i'm using quotation marks here um and and so to try to make it some sort of conspiracy where all these independent baptist churches are working together is just completely uh ridiculous if you think about it though if you're making a documentary that's highlighting spiritual abuse the easiest way to i think the goal of the documentary one of the goals is to protect people from that kind of abuse and so the easiest way to prevent it from happening is you see it happen in a group. It may be one church out of a hundred, mm-hmm. but you say, drop a hundred churches all together. No one get anywhere near them. And now you're safe. Right. Which is not true. I mean, we'll cover that eventually. Yeah. But yeah. But um, if you lump so everything so together. We, so we can, quick, yeah, quick let's answer. talk about comparisons of these different groups. Um, and, and I just want to make a real uh, statement real quick and then talk about another documentary that I watch. I watch one of the many documentaries on Hillsong and the scandals that are going on there. Uh, Brian Houston, the founder of Hillsong. Now, Hillsong, if you don't know who they are, uh, they wrote like 90% of the content. Christ- I'm, I don't know, just pulling statistics. Yeah. But a tons lot. of contemporary Christian songs that were absolute hits that were sung all across America. Um, and so many of your favorite praise and worship songs over the last 30, 40 years were written by Hillsong. Um, and so the founder had this network of churches. He had 44 different corporations. I mean, he owned these, uh, these churches, these Hillsong churches, uh, Brian Houston, um, might, he's got a trial coming up where he covered for his father's pedophilia, uh, back in the 1980s, admittedly. So in Australia's laws changed, like the state of New York's laws changed, uh, where you, now there's no statute of limitations. Um, so I know he's going to court and then you had Carl Lentz who was, um, Justin Bieber's pastor in New York City, he got in trouble. There was an investigation into that church there, sure. and it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll, literally, mm-hmm. at that church leadership and staff and all these different things. And then there was all sorts of cover-ups. So there was two observations that I had from that. 
One is, um, you could say Bill Gothard and Jack Howes had a legalistic yep. model. No one in a million years would say Hillsong uh, had a legalistic model. The exact I mean, opposite. You, you, yeah. You, yeah, it was right. exact opposite stylistically um, from top to bottom. It was very loose, very liberal uh, in, in the culture there. And they both had the same problems. Yep. Mm-hmm. So it was yep. something, it was something deeper. Than Correct. Yeah. And in watching these, uh, documentaries on a IFB, it can be tempting to say that it's, it's the conservative values or it's the, it's the adherence to biblical authority or whatever it is, or purity culture as they would call it. Right. That is causing these abuses and causing yeah. this, this, um, Systemic so, problem. So anytime, you but know, it's really anytime much sexua- deeper, it's, sexuality yeah. is expressed, okay? Mm-hmm. So on the left, I'll say, let's go on the right, okay? So you have um, very conservative dress, and dress is always talked about, always preached about, and purity is always talked about. It's hypersexualized. Mm-hmm. And right. they, they're going to have sexual problems in there. The, the Amish, man, you read about them, they're... Um, Salt Lake City, Utah, probably has the most skirts of any city in America, uh, and it has the down, most downloaded pornography of any city in America. At the same time, right. um, the highest like prescription drug use is in Salt Lake City, Utah. That's correct. And, and so we see that these big, long standards, or you could talk about Muslims over in Pakistan. Right, right. Um, they download the most pornography of any um, country in the world. And you know, all you can see on a woman is this much, right. you know, just her eyes. <laughs> yeah. um, but then you have like Carl Lentz. I don't know if you guys ever saw that Joe Rogan clip where Carl Lentz, he, they pull up a picture. There's a redhead comedian on the, I can't think of the guy's name. They pulled up, and this is before Carl Lentz, the pastor at Hillsong, got in trouble. Um, they pull up a picture. Hey, Jamie, pull that up. And um, so Carl Lentz is up there with Justin Bieber, and they're walking across the parking lot. And Carl Lentz has his shorts and, like, no underwear on. I mean, just really low. Yeah. And so Joe Rogan makes, you know, vulgar comment. He's like, there's only one reason you dress like that is because you're out there looking for. And then he says, Jesus wants you to pull your pants up, dude. Yeah. So that's a pastor he's talking about. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, so you have Hillsong, highly sexualized culture. And then you have the opposite end of the spectrum where... You can. Yeah, you yes. Have, you have this. They have the spectrum, but the the overall point is is that it, it goes to a baser problem, a deeper problem mm-hmm. than than the standards you're teaching or not teaching or whatever it is that you particularly want to pick out as right. the reason for these so, abuse so cases would, or the reasons. Would, would for you these say there's a problem with being a predator, <clears throat> or predators or whatever? Would you wouldn't you say it's a human problem? Correct. You know, it's, if we were going to be biblicists and go to the Bible, we, we've been warned about these things. Mm-hmm. And as the Apostle Paul um, points out over and over again, that, that this is a heart, heart and human problem. And we were also told that as the times get closer to Christ's coming, that evil men were gonna, are going to wax, wax worse and worse. And, worse. Yeah. and it says seducers in there as well, which mm-hmm. would give it... Um, these evil men and seducers shall wax right. worse. Right. So, so there's a uh, even a distinction made between evil men and seducers, which would give us uh, the kind of men we're talking about here and the kind of things that we're talking about. So, I want to talk about wolves real quick, and then we're going to talk about comparisons of groups. Okay. We're going to compare the IFB to just other groups out there. Um. So Paul said in Acts chapter number twenty, after my departure, shall grievous wolves enter in. It says from without, and then also shall rise up with from within. So the apostle two thousand years ago warned the church, and he was like a sheepdog. And he says, "I know that after I'm leaving town, wolves are going to come in." So Jesus warned us about wolves in sheep's clothing, mm-hmm. and so we talk about seducers uh, acting worse and worse. So there was some of the greatest preachers and motivation motivation uh, speakers that's what they're doing they're seducing the whole audience right right and uh so sheep feed upon the word of god that's their that's the bread of life i mean man should not live by bread alone but by every word um wolves feed on what sheep sheep yeah. and so there's three types uh you know a ways that they can prey on the sheep 
spiritually, being a false teacher, uh, emotionally, they can feed off people emotionally, mm -hmm. and then they feed off people physically. And so um, these people are getting in trouble and getting shifted around. Uh, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. Um, and the reason why they're in these groups is not for the money, because there ain't no money in it. Mm -hmm. uh, they're in it for the access that right. uh, they have to sheep. To sheep, yeah, exactly. Yeah, to sheep. Um, so let's talk about uh, some comparisons to other groups. So um, I have some interesting stuff on this, but I, I wanted to just make the disclaimer um, the statistics I have are about sexual abuse, and I kind of um, hesitated to bring up this fact in the first place because I think that sexual abuse statistics are probably the most inaccurate statistics right. that are out Absolutely. there. Absolutely, because what we're looking at is just the tip of the iceberg. And you notice how most victims um, they want to suppress it, they want to put yep. it out of their butt mind, they want to convince themselves it didn't happen. And many of them held off for years and years and years and, and years before they said anything. I think of like that. Uh, for instance, that Jerry Sandusky down at Penn State, I think there was 56 boys he molested. Mm -hmm. And this that was all from like decades right. back. And no one knew about it until... But until yeah. it's like the dam broke. Right. Like one person right. came forward and then they said, well, if they can do it, I can do it. Um, there's that one medical doctor that molested like 150 some uh, Olympic athletes. Mm. Mm -hmm. And right. he was recently tried like two or three years ago. Right. But it, it, that's what it had. Years it took and like years. So... Yeah. All of these statistics are only from the people who have come forward. Right. Correct. And to, it's really just, it's not to compare and to say the IFB is no better or, or no worse. What it is to, is to speak to Gabe's point is that this abuse problem is not just an IFB problem. It's a people problem. And so um, I was doing some research looking um, online and uh, I found an article in Psychology Today by this man that uh, Thomas Planty and he's attempting to use accurate data to exonerate Catholic priests. He says that there's a problem. Um, you know, comedians joke about it, everything. You know, you go to the priest, you're going to get molested, whatever. Um, and he was trying to say that the problem isn't as systemic as people might think, and it's not as bad as people might think. And so he's coming at it from that um, perspective. And he says about 4% of Catholic clerics had credible or substantiated accusations of child sexual abuse of minors during the last half of the 20th century. Um, and then in that um, article, he also writes, um, if you re review insurance claims against church communities for sexual victimization perpetrated by their clerics, you'll find that there's no difference between Catholic and non-Catholic groups. And so he's lumping all of churches together. Mm -hmm. But then the Department of Education found that about 6% of public school teachers had credible or substantiated claims of sexual abuse of minor children that are under their charge. And, you know, mm -hmm. we've heard people say, hey, why aren't we shutting down the public schools if there's problems there as well, or right. the Catholic Church? Or, um, But this is really the, the kicker. Um, the American Psychiatric Association came out with numbers that said approximately 3 to 5% of men meet the diagnostic criteria for pedophilia. Mm -hmm. And so not just... 4% of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. not just 6% of teachers, but people in general, mm -hmm. 3 to 5%. Mm -hmm. And so you'd say that's probably the mean, that's the, the average. And then as far as the, um, just using the Let Us Pray documentary, um, they recorded 412 <laughs> allegations of abuse over the span of um, 30 years, going back to 1970 or so, um, which is more than 30 um, in 187 mm -hmm. churches, but um, looking up approximately how many IFB churches there are, um, you'd say somewhere between 10 and 15,000. So if we use the lower number and use that to find our average, you'd say about 4% of churches yeah. have yeah. reported so, sexual abuse. And so, so, so not to dismiss. It's not dismissive at all. No, the it's crime just, no. or uh, the, any problems. Um, but if compared to other groups, it's not systemic, and it was really a broad brush attack. I think on, um, you know, what we believe. Right. Also, if you notice, um, there was a few bad actors that caused most of the damage. It's kind of like, um, you know, uh, on Twitter you have the bad preacher clips. I don't know if you guys ever watched those, but mm -hmm. they're pretty funny uh, and pretty cringeworthy at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and so I'll watch them. 
uh, when they come across, like, oh, good grief, man. You know, what? why are you saying that? And I always think, you know, people are going to, so somebody's out there is associating you mm-hmm. with me. Right, right. And I would not let you say that behind my pulpit. If you did, I would follow up your sermon by um, denouncing what you just said behind my pulpit. Right, right. Um, but yet it's, you know, IFB bad preacher clips. Mm-hmm. And so look at, look at, you want to know what Jack Young acts like? Uh, watch this guy. And if you look at how many people are in their clip, it's about 30 guys. Repeated over Repeated. and over again. Yeah. And right. how many it's, IFB it's, churches it's, are there? Yeah. 10 to 15,000. Right. right. So not so, everyone's out there saying crazy stuff. Right. right. That's not to say there isn't. Right. But. Okay. So let's see if we can do some, uh. Just uh, encouraging and also, you know, just giving kind of like a, a summary and an answer, uh, try to help people out as far as uh, what do you think some of the problems that have been or some of the solutions, and we'll get into, and get into that. Sure. Well, I think we've done a good job. At, we, we haven't hidden from the fact that, that there's certain systems within uh, what you would call an independent fundamental Baptist, that there's flaws in, some, in the systems and, and man-made systems that get mixed in. And uh, so I don't think we're hiding from the fact that there are problems. Right. No, no. And, and we're certainly not dismissing physical, uh, sexual, spiritual abuse or emotional abuse. No. And like you pointed out with the wolves that are entering in and what they feed on. And so um, I think we've done a good job at uh, understanding that there's, there's issues. We're not, we're not um, denying that. What we are trying to push back on is the idea that it's systemic to the same extent that, that you would um, – that is being portrayed and that there are good reasons to stay within an independent fundamental Baptist church that we're not. So, something so let me to ask you this, Gabe, those that are within and have had problems, do you think that there's any like root cause to those problems and cover ups? Is there any mentalities that are wrong? Well, or maybe I, I, um, obviously, you know, you know, something's flawed. Yeah, in, we've in highlighted a, a little bit of it, but I think I think you can boil it down to a personality worship and mm-hmm. and um, oh, and getting uh, and having uh, and so like and as an antidote to that uh, of uh, personality worship within the church or things of that nature would be in the prevention of that would be um, would be expository preaching right. and. Making sure that the men of the of your church uh, are godly men, and you're feeding yeah. the men, and you're training the men to become yeah. godly men of God. So, so, so you'd say so that there's that there's accountability within the church. Poor behavior comes from poor doctrine. Correct. Yeah. And so, if I would say one of the big flaws, you know, the the joke in the the Hiles movement is a multitude of sowing. No, sowing covers a multitude of sins. Yeah. So if you can say we're getting people saved, and uh, you know if you you know if you let this be known, you know people are not going to get saved in here. Dave Hiles actually said that to one of his victims. If you tell anyone, he says, oh, "My ministry is going to be ruined, and people are going to go to hell. They're going to die and go to yeah. hell." Um, it, you know, if yeah. you let this be known, and it worked. I mean, so the, the best thing quiet. to do for yeah. Jesus, and so that is absolutely positively. Bad doctrine. Absolutely. In the Great yeah. Commission, he f- totally forgot about teaching them to observe all things, all mm-hmm. things whatsoever I've commanded you. So I'd say it's poor preaching. Um, you know, the guy, you know, the, a preacher in a personality driven church is going to get up and talk about himself. Yep. He's not going to preach the Bible. Yep. So right. if he's teaching and preaching the Bible and it's in the people in the pew understand the Bible for themselves, the hero of the church is. Jesus and the word of God. Right. Mm-hmm. And there's not that personality. Uh, I think there wasn't. And then when it comes to what we were talking about in the beginning of what makes a fundamental church, a fundamental church, which is adherence to the word of God, we could say that these personality preachers that are preaching their opinions and they're not, uh, they want to be the focus and the authority within the church and rather than the word of God we could hear sitting here as fundamental Baptists disqualify them as being fundamental because they're not adhering yeah, right. a- to absolutely. the fundamentals of the, of the word and, of God. And I, and I so, could point to some fundamentalists. I mean, they love to use that term. Then I would say that they are unorthodox. They are not they fundamental would, to the faith. Right. right. Well, even in the documentary, it said multiple times by the victims that um, in the church, uh, we use a confusing version 
We try and make it as clouded as possible so that the only person that can tell you what the truth from God is, is the pastor. Yes. And I would say that's completely false. The goal of the church is to teach people to feed themselves from the word of God and right. to understand what it says. And actually, I've heard you from the pulpit many times say, if, if, if you don't see it on the page, if you don't see it from the word of God, if it's something that God has not said, throw it away. And I say yeah. that to the so teenagers in, in as well. In the pulpit, I have zero authority outside of the word of God. And my job as a preacher is to... Uh, expound the word of God. This is what the Bible says, and this is what God wants you to do through his word. And look at your page. And if you don't see it on your page, then drop it. Forget it. If I leave Uh, church thinking, wow, Pastor Jack is the best, then you probably preach the sermon incorrectly. And all your doctrine comes from, it's, you know, uh, Jack said one time, Bob, you know, remember that story Jack tells about, like, no, it should be, you should know the word of God. And you might not even know that you heard or you. were taught that from me. Right. Because I'm supposed to be hiding behind the, the Bible. The beauty of explaining the, the fundamentals the is it doesn't matter who's speaking it. As long as it's truth, it's feeding you. And as you learn to appreciate God's word, you learn to kind of look past the person and look to the word right. of God. Whether, so. And that's for good or for bad. As, as we're talking about, you, the truth remains the truth, whether or not it was someone who ends up being an yeah. abuser or yeah. covering up things, or it's still the word of God, whether it's the best preacher that there ever was. The the truth is not dependent upon the messenger. The truth is dependent upon the truth giver, which is Jesus Christ right? and yeah. his word. Yeah. And so that's where the truth ought to be placed. And so so when we hear about people leaving and deconstructing, they're, I think they're the, the sad part about it is they're looking too much at the men who had right. the message. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely, um, and that is what's driving their their exodus out of the IFB. And, and, the, and the reason why we feel terrible for the victims, and here's why I think they're um, the perpetrators um, are going to have a lot to answer to God for. For sure, um, that when they think about God, the victims, when they're trying to think about God, they um, see the the whoever did the crime against them face mm-hmm. and they just have a hard time getting past that barrier. Right. Yeah. Which well, is, you know, the stealing of their, yeah. their conscience. So. We have any, uh, safety protocols, thoughts, uh, things like that for, um, background just checks. protecting <laughs> background <laughs> checks. Uh, yeah. All, all your workers sure. at your church need to have background checks. Um, I've, and I've even done them on visitors that have come to my church, which we did find yeah. a pedophile that was coming to our church at one time. Oh. Uh, and, it was thanks to my wife. This guy gave her a vibe. She looked him up and found out he had some done some time for some pretty mm-hmm. bad things. And uh, and so as a pastor, you, have your number one job is to protect the sheep that you have. Yep. Mm-hmm. Not out of lust for more people. You right. know, th- there might be some people that you need to tell. Hey, check check don't people. Come check on them. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, I was going to say... That I, you know, I remember being uh, out at Paul Chapels, and I, he and he said, "If you're gonna work here, we're gonna vet you, I and mean, we're gonna call everybody that you ever know. I mean, they, they're gonna do deep background check." Um, I have a story when we were in Landmark Baptist Church in Michigan. I was an interim pastor, uh, and I was sitting in on the public committee, all the public committee meetings I sat in on, and we called a guy, um, and he was a candidate, and he was um, recognized. Well. Jack Scott was one of his references. And uh, then another guy who I do respect, don't give his name. And then another guy uh, who I won't name, who I can think of his name as well. But uh, so all these well-known figures in fundamentalism, but nobody from the church that he pastored in Terre Haute, Indiana. And I thought that was kind of weird. It's not a good sign. And I called my dad up and he says, well, um, Brother Parker pastors in Terre Haute. Call him and ask him if you ever heard anything about this guy, good or bad. So I called Brother Parker up, and he said, well, Jack, I'm going to give you some phone numbers. I don't want you to hear from me. I want you to hear it straight from the horse's mouth. So I called these two guys, and this guy that was coming to our church, um, man, every high crime and misdemeanor, he wouldn't, wouldn't even believe it when he was pastoring there in Terre Haute. Um, I talked one of the guys that, that – every person that I talked to, by the way, um, one was a pastor of the church out in Ogden, Utah, uh, and then the other two men were men who were in church uh, still to that day. But, I mean, they told me all sorts of things about this guy. Now, if I hadn't have called and vetted this guy, he would have got voted into the church. He's very charismatic. Again, 
a seducer is a seducer. So he can get up from the pulpit and he knows how to work people. Mm-hmm. Yep. And this guy was complete total wolf. Uh, today, you know, he's out of church and um, uh, Brother Parker, uh, you know, I don't get, but uh, yeah, his, his poor kid, his poor kids, his poor family. Um, and so make sure that you always vet people before you hire them. A lot of the problems these churches had is they're hiring people from across the country. They don't know who they are. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. References from somebody else. No personal right. references, nothing. Right. And a lot of things would have been swept under the rug anyways. Um, a big one too is um, accountability with your staff and having protocols in place where, you know, uh, the big one I think about is the teen leader driving around with a girl in the church a 15 year old girl in the whenever church by themselves. Like that should never be, I wouldn't even, we shouldn't even be alone. I shouldn't even be alone in a room mm-hmm. with a, Teenage boy, <laughs> right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it, oh yeah. You never know. Absolutely. And so we got to complete accountability. Oh, another thing I was going to say too is if you can afford it, have video cameras in your church. Yep. Mm-hmm. Even it, as a parent, I feel a, a thousand percent better coming to a church that I know has that. Mm-hmm. Um, I can rest a little easier when we come in, and my kids just run all over the place knowing that. So from yes. a from a church member perspective too, it adds a lot of credibility to the church that we, I know that they look out for. We've that. been able to play, pull a video and on different occasions and prove different stuff happened. We, you know, a couple of weeks ago <laughs> there was an activity and something low dollar value just went missing and was really bizarre. Mm-hmm. And uh so we pulled up the camera and it was a woman about 60 years old. She she like take Stuck took it, it right like in her her back. Back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Walked right out. <laughs> and um and so I, I know of another cur- church who um there was an accusation of, to one of the nursery workers about um how she handled the baby and I don't know. I mean you have to talk to your um counsel, your legal counsel about this, but they that church happened to have a video camera in the nursery. I'm sure you want to angle away from the changing tables and where the nursing mothers are. So I don't know exactly how that worked out. Yeah, right. But, um, but anyway, um, she got a lawyer. She was going to sh- sue. They pulled the tape and he said, I need you and your lawyer to come in and see something. They said, no, no, uh, come in. Cause you're gonna look like fools. And they watched the tape and the whole thing was well, just dropped. So video cameras are important. Uh, now, uh, how how do you how, what would you say pastors could do? How how could pastors handle accusations? Yeah, that's good. Uh, in a proper manner, like I understand, like having the cameras and having the protocols in place, so that you can rest on those as far as trying to prove innocence or or, or just try to define the facts of the case. But if so, someone comes to you, how how do you how do you think that should be handled? Okay, well. Um like if somebody's con- if you're counseling with somebody, I know in the state of New York, I'd have to find out about the laws. There used to be a priest parishioner law, and I think it's gone. But if you came in and you know, um, Paulina says, uh, you know, I killed John and <laughs> buried him in the backyard or whatever, um, and if I told the police, she could sue me at one point because it's priest parishioner privilege, and it would because there were so many Catholics in the state of New York, they could go on a confession. Um, so you have to. You have to tell people, here's here's what I've been told at legal seminars, that uh, just want to let you know, anything that you tell me, I am going to report it to the police. Um, but anything, anytime somebody has broken a law, whether it's embezzling money or, or whether it's some sort of um, accusation, especially like sexual accusation, mm-hmm. I would definitely make sure that you um, talk to a policeman and, and file some sort of report. Uh, if so, so you would say that su- supporting the the person the person who's claiming to be a victim, making yes. sure that you are uh, reassuring them that you're going to be there for them, yes, and that you're going to walk them through the process, you're going to help them to try to help. And that's what the law is there for: is to prove Absolutely. innocence or not. And before, I mean, you know, you don't want to be the the judge, jury, and executioner. No, and, and you need to understand. Again, we're talking about like the home. There's a balance between the home and the church and the state. And if someone breaks the state's laws, or is accused of breaking the state's laws, right, the state needs to right. be notified, and then that's their job as the government to investigate this criminal behavior. So you would say, like, just not being dismissive, right? Of no, of, no, no, of someone that comes to you. We were talking a little bit before the we were recording here, and uh, you had some good thoughts on as far as like. Uh, so a woman that comes forward to the pastor, to a deacon or something like that, mm-hmm. making sure that they have 
that they're not dismissed. R- from a female perspective and having friends, personal friends who have left the church or some still in the church um, due to f- these kind of issues, um, I hear a lot, the, th- the sentiment echoed that they felt extremely dismissed and that their husband, because he was that, especially if you're thinking of that like Gothard model, he could do no wrong. He was above reproach right. and therefore she was repeatedly dismissed. And that led to a huge um, disruption in her spiritual life. And I've seen this on multiple accounts where because of that dismissal, abuse perpetuated. And then, like we were saying, she associates that abuse with God's character. And so I think that the root of the issue could have been dealt with differently, where if she was just um, acknowledged and believed, it would have been a totally different story. And the people who are still have a close walk with God and were able to mend that relationship were believed and it was handled correctly. So I think so much is, there is so much um, importance on that initial report and how that's handled. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot's riding on, on those of us that are trusted with information right. to, to, and, be, to um, be fair with the information. And justice and equality is something that is the thread throughout uh, scripture right. and God himself is the defender of the defenseless. I'd say that's a fundamental. <laughs> that is a fundamental. <laughs> so true. Right. And you know, the fatherless and the widow, like any down and out or any, any person that is, um, is some sort of a victim. You need to be on their side, no matter what it costs you or, uh, or, or your ministry or your ministry. Right. And right. a lot of women don't speak about these things because they have this fear that they won't be believed because mm. they don't see that godly character portrayed in authority at times and it's a sad thing so if 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 the authority in churches can portray that just on a daily basis maybe more people would be very comfortable bringing things out sooner and it would be dealt with quicker instead of perpetuated i think one of the um, accusations too against baptist circles and fundamental circles is that a, a woman is minimized um, and she's not as important, and that's really just not true about a fundamental in Scripture either. Is that a woman is equal? A woman is, you know, right there with the yeah, man, and that God, yeah. the, the the Bible and the standards in the Bible always lift up and elevate the position of women. And so, um, I think a lot of times women might be afraid to come forward because in their church, or maybe from the pulpit, um, men are improperly placed. In their homes and, and their roles, yeah. and, and we we saw that said saw that in both circles in both documentaries. <laughs> mm-hmm. One was in the church, and then one was in the home. And so, if you had like a bad guy, a bad actor who was a father, and the Bill, that Bill Gothard model appealed to him, there was good fathers in there too, not yeah. just all bad. Oh, sure. right. But there's a bad father who wants to be like a slave driver to his right. family. Um, you saw that in Let Us Pray too, not, as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah there's there's certain. Um, approaches to scripture that can uh, uh, pr- certainly provide a man with the with the ammunition to dominate his family right but that's not the incorrectly what, that's understood. not the, that's not the a, correct that's interpretation. Not a correct interpretation again it goes back to bad it's doctrine. all violent yeah it goes back to bad doctrine yeah yeah and uh, and making sure that we have godly men in our in our churches and women uh, and me being sure that we are um, just stressing yeah. The proper yeah, I, balance in yeah. scripture that uh, that submission is a voluntary thing on all sides. Right. And, and it can be achieved, right? Like I've seen both sides of that coin, the good, the bad, and the ugly a, as a woman. And um, I'm comfortable. I, I want to be a, in a fundamental Baptist because I know that balance can be achieved. Right. And there yeah. are good churches out there, and those blanket statements are just not true because they're, it's possible to achieve that correct balance. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And we're, you know, in every church, has uh, sinners in it, and yeah. in, in every church has hypocrites in it. Everybody's a hypocrite. They preach to a you know, preach a higher level than sometimes they're sure. living. Not up only to. just in it, but also leading it, right? Right. Not the point right. to point, but I mean, it, and, and so true. yeah. So then again, um, you know, we hold up the scripture. We hold up Jesus Christ. He's the hero. He's the perfect man. Uh, Jack Young, praise God! I don't have to preach him on Sunday. <laughs> right. I get to preach Jesus. You, you know, my church will be in big trouble if I preach Jack Young on on Sundays. Um, but I, I have a couple encouraging thoughts and then you guys can add to that. Um, you know, I've coming up on 20 years of full-time Christian service, full-time in the ministry. I've talked to several people who have been many people, uh, who have been, uh, as child victims, uh, sexual abuse. Um, however, not one of them had ever been sexually abused inside the church. 
It was always other places. Most of the time, it was actually family members. Mm -hmm. Um, And as a pastor, you have to deal with that reality that you are going to have church members who have suffered uh, abuse as children, and, you know, you're going to have to know how to uh, try to be a help to them or point them to somebody who can help them. I I can't be a counselor to everybody. Right. Um, uh, multitude of counselors are safety. So there are those people. Um, but then I, I wanted to make mention of, uh, cause some people have been powerfully influenced by people they no longer respect. Um, mm-hmm. good. now like, you know, some of our fundamentalist brethren, they could look at, uh, for instance, Billy Graham and all he, all the great things he says about the Pope. And, you know, I'm sh- more sure the Pope's going to heaven than I'm going to heaven, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, or, you know, and so doctrinally now, Moral, uh, morally, Billy Graham was always pure. He had an accountability part. Amazing. Never touched a dollar. He had uh, this guy, A.T. Wilson, that traveled with him. who's like his personal pastor and accountability partner who, like, preached to him, prepared, you know, essentially devotions for him uh, to keep him spiritually straight and accountable. Uh, but doctrinally, we say, man, he, you know, kind of veered to the left in this ecumenicalism <laughs> stuff. Uh, but, however, tens of thousands of people were saved by Billy Graham. That is unarguable. Right. Um, and then you got a lot of people like, for instance, um, a lot of people who we know who are powerfully influenced by Jack Hiles. Now all this stuff is coming out. And again, I'm not saying that, um, you know, it's 100 percent true, but there is smoke, there's fire, there's, you know, everything else at this point. We say, I know that guy was a blessing to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, yeah, I, I remember driving out oh, was, was I, on I-40 in Oklahoma, driving down the highway like 75 miles an hour. And Jack Hiles almost made me wreck my car because I was listening to, I was listening to um, Fresh Oil that he preached in the 1970s. And, man, I was bawling. I was like tears coming down my cheek and I'm like, oh, trying to drive. And, uh, my, man, you know, I, you know, I want the Holy Spirit. Powerful motivational spirit. Mm-hmm. Um, and also many people modeled their ministries somewhat after him and saw great results, and they were good men of God. Um, I you the, like you were saying earlier, the truth is the truth, right? And what truth was there was effective and was That's powerful. Right. And, and and so I have a you know illustration that cause I grew up in a Christian home. I was taught the gospel, and in my mind, I believe the gospel. And you know, I was taught the uh, Romans Road and I taught how to be a soul winner. And I would say, and I didn't get saved and come to know the know Christ till I was twenty two. Um, that there was probably this would be conservative, at least a hundred people that I had showed from the Bible, how they could know for sure if they're dead, if they go to heaven, um, you know, and I, I could speak the gospel to them and not believe it. Mm-hmm. Right. And see, they could look at the word of God. They could hear and see from scripture how Jesus Christ died for their sins on the cross. Um, who's to say, you know, I don't know what percentage of uh, those people actually receive Christ, but I bet one of them did. Right, and then and they look at you at 22 saved, and, and say, oh, that's the guy who led me to Christ. Right. Right. Exactly. Doesn't so the, mean it's so the not truth true. is the truth, and the gospel is the gospel. And so someone has been a blessing to you in the past. Um, it was the truth that, that they ministered to you. And um, honestly, we could all say that about our parents, too. We mentioned it already. But, like, right. man, uh, you know, there's failures intertwined with successes and truth and things that they taught you but you you know we all have to kind of deconstruct that break it down say what was good what was bad eat the chicken spit out the bones and move again, on. and um and those who sin particularly you know sin in a certain way they had to pay for their sin right you know a lot of these guys who were who were so worried about how they looked well how do you look now yeah right yeah. now how's your legacy right and so um yeah i want to encourage people that way the gospel is the gospel's truth any other thoughts? Any other encouraging thoughts on this uh, discouraging topic? Right? <laughs> well, I'll just say yeah. my, my my piece as to why I stay. Yes, because yeah, yeah. I mentioned in my my testimony, I came as a blank slate, willing to leave if I needed to. Uh, but why did I stay? The reason why I stayed is because of the simplicity of the doctrine of the of the Word of God, worshiping the worshiping God with a clear conscience, according to my conscience. Uh, in simplicity, uh, well, First Corinthians one twelve, which I, I wanted to say, but I, I know I can't quote right now. But, uh, but uh, in simplicity and in truth, mm-hmm. and that's what the IFB offers me. Or, um, well, being an independent fundamental Baptist, 
means to me. It's a simple biblical model. It's yep. a, it's a simple biblical model that and and within the circles I've been in, the there's been a supremacy placed on the truth, right. wherever it leads, mm-hmm. right. and um, and there's room for people to disagree upon right. different things and grow and, so, and to grow together. Understanding there's a hu- there's a humility, and I know this is opposite of what these documentaries say, right? But uh, my experience has been is that there's been a humility both in the teacher and the learner that we're both on the same journey trying to get to the same place. Right. And uh, one and is not above the other. And one is not both above subservient the other. to the word of God and being subservient to the same thing. So, right. yeah, and so and that, I, those are the reasons right. why I stay. So you're sense. an independent fundamental Baptist out of conviction. Correct. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's exactly what I'd say for myself. And I, I am a Baptist because I, be, I believe, I mean, and that's the label that we use. I believe that the Bible makes us Baptists in our ecclesiology, in our church government, and we're independent because that is the model that we see in it's Scripture. scripture. Yep. And it's okay if you're not. You know, right. We don't have a corner on the truth. We don't. And, and know, so. I tell you, you know, yeah. like behind uh, behind here, all these books, I, I want to say maybe 25% of those guys are Baptists. Right. So we're not saying that God does not use other forms. God always will use you to the fullest extent that you are participating in the truth. Right. God right. wants to bless you. And, and that's an accusation on the fundamental that, that people bring to us is that we believe that we're the only ones. I've never met no never met anybody that has that would claim that or say that 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 we are the only ones that if you're not an independent fundamental Baptist then you're lost and you're going to hell and blah blah blah. I'm sure that you could find some preacher yeah, who said those, that. It's those uh, thirty preachers on uh, yeah, bad yeah, preacher yeah, yeah. clubs. But yeah. Yeah. but my personal experience is that's not the case, and I would never say anything yeah. like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know that truth, like we were just talking about, truth can be found in other places. As yeah. Well. Amen. So. Amen. Paulina Wait. gets the last word. Wait, what about me? She'll get the last word, and then I'll get the last word. Oh, okay. Go ahead. (laughs) I agree totally with what Gabe said, that um, I choose to go to an independent, fundamental Baptist church and to claim that because of what the Scripture shows, and I've had plenty of time to search it out and to really come to um, the conclusion that that's my conviction and doctrinally correct, and I feel really comfortable raising my children this way um, with the good faith that they'd be able to do that too, to search the scripture and come to the same conclusions. And I really appreciate my church because of that. And the beauty about this, the independence of it is that if that's not what I find in my church, I can go to a different Mm -hmm. church and find one that does does. have those things that I'm looking for. And um, like I said earlier with the, with the documentary, it kind of frames it as this cookie cutter model and it's so not that. Um, So I, I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for, being a Baptist, and even even after seeing these documentaries that are truly troubling, I still feel completely confident in my decision and mm-hmm. um, raising my children that way. Amen. I think when you're watching the shows, um, one of the first thoughts that comes to anyone's mind, and I think it's framed this way intentionally, is initially you say you start to question why the question pops right up: Why am I an independent fundamental Baptist? Why do I believe? Am I what they're portraying? Um, if you're being honest. And as you watch the show, you recognize that um, the people who are perpetrating these terrible crimes and doing these things to people are not what we claim to be. Um, They are not following the tenets of the Word of God. They are not um, allowing the Holy Spirit to lead them. They're not living with humility. And so, um, you know, you go into it. I know a lot of people who are scared to even see a show like that because they think it'll shake their faith. But for me... (laughs) Um, it actually strengthened my position in, in that um, the word of God works, humility works. Um, it strengthened my, I was telling my, my mother this after watching the show because, you know, you don't even want your mom to hear what you just saw, you know what I mean? And I told her, you know, it's, 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 re- it's a reminder to each of us to have the humility to recognize that what was perpetrated is actually inside of all of us and we have the right. capability to be that if we're not careful right. to adhere to the word of God and to have a humble heart and to recognize that I'm not the reason why anyone's coming to this church. I'm not the reason why people should hear the word of God preached. The word of God is. And so um, being a Baptist is centered around the word of God. It's not centered around a person. And um, I would say to anybody who finds himself in a ministry where a person is lifted up or even a set of ideals 
is lifted up more than the word of God to, um, as my wife said, find somebody, find some place where um, the word of God is the root. And because of that, if you find a place like that, you can be an independent fundamental Baptist. And leave us with a quote from one of the, one of the girls you were telling us earlier. It was really good. Um, In the article of the uh, woman, who started this movement, she was the um, journalist who wrote the stories of the women for Let Us Pray, Sarah Smith. Um, one of the women, most of the women, you know, left the movement, left the IFB, left being a Baptist, left God altogether. Um, but there was one story that stood out to me. Um, the woman says that she's married to a pastor. She's still in a Baptist church. And I thought it was funny that they included that because it was so opposite what their message was. And... Um, She reiterated that it took her years. Um, Obviously, the damage was done. Um, But she got to the point where she recognized that it was a man that abused her and not God. Um, And at some point, um, she had to come to that distinction that um, she was able to separate the person that abused her in God's name from God himself and was able to continue to live her faith and trust God um, with her life because of that distinction. And so... Um, I think that's important to recognize. Amen. Yeah. Hate hate sin and love God. Amen. That was good. Thanks, guys. Guys, you did a great job. Thanks wow. for letting me in. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. All right. Well, God bless each and every one of you. Listen this long. And um, I hope this was a help and a blessing. Leave a like or a comment uh, below here. And, uh, and we'll see you next time on the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. Thank you so much for watching or listening to the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. And we'd love to hear from you. Please reach out to us at pastorthoughtsmail at gmail.com. Also, if you want to check out more uh, about our ministry here, you can visit pastorjack.org. I do have a blog that I do write. I'd love to have you as one of my subscribers there. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.